good morning or afternoon to anybody. So I first would like to thank uh, the organizer and congratulate them for the organization because it's really nice and very, very interesting. So I would like to present you some uh, new and recent data about the context of uh, personic vocalization characteristics uh, in laboratory mice that I did uh, in collaboration with Fabrice de Chaumont, uh, who is here and who developed really, really, really nice tools. And um, so just to, for the little story, so we organized in Pasteur 11 years ago, kind of a similar meeting, but much less, much more in an amateur way, I would say, compared to this one. And in fact, one of the topic of interest was about the context of uh, emission of ultrasonic vocalizations. And I'm still interested in that, and I go a bit uh, deeper in that. So I will uh, not uh, teach you anything about the context of emission of ultrasonic vocalizations. So with the pup isolation course in the first two weeks of life, uh, the same-sex interactions for juveniles and adults, also male and female interactions in adults. And also we got a vocalization aversive context like Sylvie presented with a con uh, restraint stress and also doing exploration of novel environment. Um, also Sylvie presented some um, of that. And so I was wondering about the spontaneous usage of ultrasonic vocalizations in freely behaving mice. Um, because what I found was mostly about uh, wild mice in, uh, in which a uh, researcher made field studies for California mice and brush mice. And in fact, they got a kind of close um, context uh, whether there was a mate or not in the in presence of the localizing mice. And also they made uh, acoustic description of the different uh, vocalizations for the brush mice. And in another uh, study in the lab with wild mice also, uh, they made uh, kind of a long-term recordings, but with uh, animals separated in uh, two different compartments. So you've got uh, the two compartments here, and one mouse is living here, and the other one is living here, and they can interact with this little social window, what they call. And so they noticed that uh, many vocalizations were given in the social context of this window, and also in the peeing corners, I would say. And they were acoustically different from vocalizations given in the feeding or drinking um, uh, parts of the environment. And uh, so in a pilot study that we did with Fabrice, we uh, looked at um, uh, vocalizations emitted by uh, pairs of same-sex animals that are familiar to each other. And we recorded only four pairs of males and four pairs of females for three days and nights. And we follow them, and uh, what we notice is that, in fact, pairs of males emit very, very few vocalizations spontaneously, compared to females that emitted a lot of vocalizations. And the births were also shorter, with less vocalizations for each burst. And also the context of emission was quite different, with the males emitting most of them when they were alone, so isolated from the other one, not in contact, while females emitted most of the vocalizations in contact. And uh, so this is concordant with what we hear this morning. And um, also we were able to measure, in fact, um, the speed of the animals uh, during, for instance, the approach before um, a contact. And we noticed that, in fact, so this was only in females, the contacts that were accompanied by vocalizations were done at a higher speed compared to the contact to the approach uh, given without USBs. So this might also introduce the fact that, um, in fact, USVs represent the arousal of the animals that are more excited and they vocalize when they are more excited. So kind of internal state measurements. And uh, what I wanted to know later, it's uh, whether you have uh, specific acoustic uh, features of the vocalizations when they are given in different contexts. And so for that purpose, we use uh, with uh, Fabrice a similar type of setup. So we use, in fact, the live mouse tracker um, system. So the live mouse tracker is a kind of a system that allows you to follow the animals individually, but living in groups. So here you have picture with four animals, but in the setup, I use only two animals because I still don't know who is vocalizing. And you can automatically extract behavior, and uh, these behaviors are automatically given with uh, the individual behavior, contact behavior, and dynamic behavior between two animals. 
And this is, um, and at the same time, we recorded the vocalizations that are given throughout the experiment. So it was, it was recorded each time a detect, uh, vocalizations were detected. And these vocalizations were um, analyzed through the USB toolbox developed by Fabrice. And um, we have the acoustic features of the, of the data and all of that was synchronized and we get the behavioral context of the humans. So this can this is a kind of automatization. And uh, so I tell all this, but in fact, I did also manual scoring because we needed to go from automatization a bit into more details, and then we will go back to automatization. So this is also a nice tool um, developed by Fabrice. Yes, Fabrice does everything, so just ask him and he will do. Um, <laughs> And he developed a tool in which you are labeled just by clicking to label your vocalization. So this is really time saving and quite convenient to use. And you can build your own labels, whatever you want. And at the same time, you have, uh, we synchronize this with, uh, so the LIMOS tracker, our thermal camera, and also different webcams that we put around the cages to have really a fine definition of the behaviors. And uh, I scroll manually. Also, the different behaviors that I observed here, each time I see an interesting vocalization. And this is a kind of an ethological keyboard that also Fabrice program, and it's also very, very convenient. Um, and so uh, I choose to label only a specific type of uh, acoustic characteristics. So these are not call types, it's just acoustic features of the of the signal. So you have this uh, vocalization, this, this signal that is highly high in frequency and quite noisy. You have a long and simple vocaliz uh, vocalization that is only in one uh, part. And you have this uh, the presence of this low component around 40 kilohertz uh, and any type of shape above. We don't care. So this is only the three type of vocalizations that I present here because I didn't have time to do more. And this represents only around 15% of the whole vocalization stuff, but this can be combined also with other types of vocalizations. So uh, you can see already that there is a huge variability between the pairs, so the color of the plants uh, are the different pairs that we recorded. So we recorded six um, pairs of females. Uh, yes, so we have forgot to point out that I record only females to have enough uh, stuff to analyze, in fact. And so the first type of call is um, high and noisy signals, where uh, these are a few examples of them. And uh, we looked at the context in which it was occurring, and almost all of them occurred when the animals were jumping around uh, at the wall. So the question is whether, is it a vocalization, or is it only just a pulse on the wall that are just um, doing that, or the animals that is uh, coughing when it's come back down. So this is one type of um, um, acoustic features for the long and simple um, vocalizations. So here are also a few examples. And uh, so we looked at the different behaviors that I labeled manually. And what was observed, it was it was it was mostly given doing nose and genital sniffing. It can be also in the nest. So the behavior are not exclusive, so they can be combined. And it was mostly given doing mid-intensity behaviors. So and there are um, yeah, and the last type of call is the presence of this uh, low frequency component about 40 kilohertz. And you can see that the shape can be quite different above, but you have always this uh, low frequency component. And it was occurring mostly when, uh, so rarely in nose nose contact and mostly when one animal was behind the other one. And it was uh, when uh, there was mostly mounting or the nose on the back or the paw on the back. And this was um, kind of a behavior that occurs so during this mounting. So you have this type of profile with low components that is occurring very frequently. So nose on the back combined with the follow behavior or the pro on the back combined with the nose on the back. So I would say that this uh, mounting, the, no the nose on the back, the follow behavior and everything, this is a kind of similar behavior that is just um, so the nose on the back and follow its kind of attempts of mounting. And just, yeah, so these are really female-female interactions. So what uh, was observed, it was already this type of behavior with a low frequency component in the male-female interactions with the male. And this type of calls was very frequent during the mounting um, behavior of the male-female interactions. So basically what we show here is that this uh, type of vocalization is not specific to the mounting, to the courtship behavior, but it might be more specific to the mounting behavior. 
both in males and in females. Uh, so perspective of this work is to annotate other, other acoustic features and to combine them to have a, a more uh, precise call types and also testing different traits of mic to identify stable components and also testing the effect on the receiver because we can now compare behavior. So in the data that we have compared the same behavior with and without vocalizations, like what we did with the approach contact. And uh, so the second part of the talk um, is about the function of this specific type of vocalization. Uh, so for the little story, this little uh, sequence of vocalizations was identified uh, when uh, Fabrice uh, tried to sort automatically uh, noise background noise sequences from sequences containing ultrasonic vocalizations. Uh, he built a nice machine learning, and in fact, these type of sequences were not identified as vocalizations. So this is what triggered our, our interest. And um, in fact, you have different examples of sequences that were not identified as vocalizations here. So you have some in males, male pair, and in female pairs. And basically, it was given in this type of, be of behavior. So you have vocalizations that is on here. You have one mouse in the corner, the other one is a nest. Same things here, one mouse in the nest, the other one is a corner. And you have the vocalizations now. And in fact, it's um, when the green animal here and here are um, depositing urine in big quantities. So when they are urinating, they emit this type of vocalizations. So both males and females. So we decided to go a bit uh, deeper in this investigation. So this is the kind of uh, timeline that we get when we report the animals with a lion mouse tracker for two days and two nights. So you have the activity for the green mouse, the red mouse that is tracked here. The dark phase is the night, and here you have the day and night. And you have the vocalizations that are here in black. And you have the peeing, uh, the urination sequences from the green mouse or the red mouse here. And you see how it is distributed over the day. And you have uh, these gold uh, dots here are urination sequence, uh, urinations that are not accompanied by vocalizations. So this I go back a bit uh, later with uh, manual uh, digging in the data. But I found some urination that were not accompanied by vocalizations. And approximately for each uh, pair recorded, so from the six pairs that I recorded, I got 11 urination sequences over the two days. And this was uh, quite um, stable across experiments. And so I tried to investigate whether it has an effect on the other mouse in the cage when one mouse was urinating. And so for that purpose, I look at what is occurring before and after the PE. So you have this urination here from the red mouse. And I looked whether the other mouse uh, is coming back in the corner. So if the mouse is urinating, urinating here, I look in the two minutes after whether the green mouse is coming in the corner and investigate the corner. So here on this timeline, you can see that the red mouse is urinating. You have the red mouse in the corner here. And you can see that the green mouse is coming in the corner within the two minutes after P. And so I did um, this um, measurements and I compared uh, so the visits that were done in the corner when one mouse were, was urinating and emitting vocalizations. When one mouse was only urinating and no, not giving you um, vocalizations. And when one mouse was sitting in the corner but without urinating, without vocalizing, just a long stay in the corner, which is approximately the same length as a urin urination. And what I found, in fact, is uh, that um, the probability to visit the corner after USB uh, plus urine or urine without USB or corner without urine without USB is approximately similar. So basically, um, it doesn't have such an effect on the, on the other modes. So it's not a kind of an attractive or repulsive signal from what I observe in this data, but uh, maybe it can be sorted off. <laughs> Uh, so the next uh, thing that we did was to, um, so I did this with uh, Fabrice and, oh, sorry, uh, Anna Perez, she's online and a student girl in uh, We tried to design a playback experiment to test whether the animals were attracted or not by these urination sequences of vocalizations. 
And we use this type of modules. We have the two loudspeaker here. We put also you in here, uh, the two sides, and we have background noise on one side and you in on the you in six seconds on the other side. But um, unfortunately, the time that we set up the protocol, we got only two miles, two mails that uh, were tested in the right protocol. But they apparently um, uh, avoided the side with the urination uh, sequence, and they spend more time here, and they groom themselves a lot. So we did, we decided, so with the help of Marcus Bohr, he gave me some advices for playback experiment, and uh, decided to do for to go for another setup in which have no walls and things like that. So you have this platform here on which the mice was, you have the two loudspeaker here, and the animals were first habituated to the setup in really the same temporal organization as I will use for the playback experiments. So first one minute of exploration of the platform, then 10 minutes under a grid uh, enclosure, then two minutes of free exploration, again, 10 seconds under a grid enclosure, and again, two minutes of uh, exploration of the platform. And this the day after. Um, so I tasted uh, 12 males and 12 females, they were adults, and I, um, do it on the second day. So I did playback. So I choose a urination sequence compared to background noise on the other side, or a sequence of vocalizations that were recorded during photo sequences between two females, so unfamiliar to the tested animals, compared to background noise also. And I randomized the site of the signal and the background for each mouse, and also the order of presentation for either follow or urination sequences. And uh, so the playback were done when the, were started when the animal was under the grid enclosure, and so the signals were broadcasted two times. And the second time was without the grid enclosure, so that the animal can run freely. And so the first reaction uh, to the playback uh, was uh, in males and females approximately similar, so they uh, freeze and orient, um, so at least they perceive the signal, which is already a good point in playback experience. And, uh, but otherwise, um, the first orientation was a kind of a perfect mix of attraction and repulsion. I couldn't do better, it was really six and six. Uh, who oriented towards the loudspeaker with the noise or towards the loudspeaker with the, back, uh, with the sequence that I wanted to test. So, perfect chance of that. And next, um, I looked at the time spent in the proximity to the loudspeaker. So, I compared the time spent here in this zone here compared to this zone here, whether there was a signal or the background noise. So, so the both times here are 100% of uh, presence and what you observe here. So if the animals are above 50%, meaning that they spend more time in the signal section, and when they are under, they spend less time in the signal section. So when I put uh, the urination sequence, you can see that there, there's a kind of a nice distribution, normal distribution for uh, around chance level. So basically they don't really care about uh, urination sequences. And when I put the follow uh, sequences, in fact, only the maze were slightly more interested uh, toward the follow sequence compared to background noise. So at least they were interested by something. And it was this follow uh, behavioral uh, sequence from the females. So, um, and this was even more um, specific when uh, uh, I broadcast the follow sequence at the first time and not in the second time. So, which is also what we know about habituation from, from mice and rats. Um, yeah, so that's uh, this um, testing this function. So these are unpublished data. So if you have other ideas, I would like um, to hear them. I have some ideas to continue, but not so many. And uh, so from this thing, we can see that combining USB behavioral monitoring allow to refine the behavioral description, which is quite interesting. And we notice different uh, new behaviors, such as the urination behavior, for instance. Um, and here, we still don't know the function exactly of this signal. So whether it's an advertisement and simply the other one just didn't care. And at that moment, this can be an option. And for that purpose, I would like to test other strains, which might also give some insights. And also to test different levels of familiarity between animals. 
And finally, uh, what is really missing is uh, to identify the emitter of ultrasonic localization, which are, I think many of us uh, wait for that. So I'm also still waiting for it. And I would be really keen on finding it. And I thank you for your attention and thank my collaborators from the Institute of Pasteur, where I was, uh, from the I2BMC, where I am now, and the different collaborators from um, uh, Raymond Space from Airsoft, Anna Perez from Spain, Marcus, and my student also again. Even. So thank you very much. Um, you said that these uh, organizations uh, as well as um, uh, mountains uh, we get there. It's um, how much different are they from the um, male um, worship organization that has, for example, a when you know, when there's no female uh, around at the mount, when they are not committed, but when they are, uh, for example, when there's urine, female urine. In the spot and the windows and worship organizations. So I, I'm not sure whether in this type of behavior, of behavior we still have this vocalization with this low frequency component. And what I didn't do is acoustic analysis, precise acoustic uh, analysis to check whether acoustically they are different. Uh, so this low frequency component vocalization, if they are different between males and females and also between the different uh, context for males, whether there is another female or whether there is only you and things like that. I didn't test it. So I have two questions. The first one is about the sequences. So you said there's this related sequences, there's following sequences, and I guess there's many more sequences. And because you are using a lot of machine learning together with the case, this is actually when giving uh, the different sequences in the machine, is the machine able to, to say this is a duration sequence or this is a following sequence? But the machine has no further community as the sequence. So for the moment, we, we didn't, uh, so we use machine learning only to sort vocalization from noise, yeah. but not for the context. And uh, I think to get to that point, uh, I still need to dig a bit manually in the data to identify what could be the sequences, but it can be an option to check whether it is possible to identify the context from what you observe in the spectrograms. Yes, it would be good. Sequence alone is sufficient to tell this is a different behavior. So, with all to predict the, the behavior, behavior like just looking at the. This would be the next step, I would say. Yeah. Now, uh, one noise and the other is silent, or do you percent? Background noise. Background noise. Wonderful. Awesome. Uh, a couple of, couple of things. One, uh, with vocalizations and activity, I've, in, I've previously observed that uh, activity and vocalizations are logging here. So, only very high levels of activity associated with high levels of vocalizations. I wonder if you can see the reason of that. Uh, and the second one is technical. Uh, I was looking through all sonograms and it, 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 you showed something that is the bane of my existence, which was the 20 kilohertz noise that you get sometimes. Uh, it's sort of the assumption that this is due to uh, motion sensors that if someone accidentally would disconnect, it would be good for our uh, research. Or what do you think is the cause of that? Of that? So continuous uh, noise, uh, these are ventilations or ele electronic noise. And uh, so the application, the USB toolbox, discards them automatically. So this is really, really good uh, in the acoustic analysis. For the acoustic analysis, it really is acoustic analysis automatically. And for the first question for activity, um, what you observe is that we got vocalizations only when the animals are active almost. Uh, you get a few when they are in the nest, but um, not really during the day, for instance. It's only when they are walking around or when they enter the nest again and uh, when one is already sleeping inside, say, you could have a bit. Is it one? Um, get much higher, so moderate. So on the total activity over the whole, I, I didn't look at that, I, I can, yeah.
Um, with regard to your low frequency uh, when you're mounting, the female females and female males mounting low frequency, um, I think you describe that as a fundamental frequency, so that the uh, pull that is already occurring, and then we get the lower frequency as well as the upper frequency. So the, the call itself, the, the longer part of the call, would be the second harmonic then. So it should, if, if, if I understand correctly, so it should be exactly double the frequency of the lower frequency. But I couldn't really tell from the data you showed whether that was the case. It's a kind of a mix. Some of them are really so harmonic and fundamental, and some of them are not really because it's a bit disturbed in the upper part. Okay. So I, I cannot say uh, hundred percent harmonic or not. It's it's kind of a mix, and probably I should categorize subcategorize these different calls. Yeah, it's for sure. Is it that this is not two different elements? Hundred percent sure. I wouldn't say, but um, because they are really really synchronized in time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we need to know who is vocalizing. If it's possible to disentangle when they are mounting each other very close to each other with movements usually quite speed. So, thank you. Great, a lot of data. Uh, I was wondering about your data in the nest. We are not data when there are two, the NPLFT with the nest that outside the nest. Whether um, you know which animal is dominating, or is dominant or submissive. Maybe the one which is not threatened in the nest is the dominant, I don't know. Whether there are dominants in these two animals, whether you know that. And whether this could influence the fact that sometimes maybe uh, rumination means something and sometimes it doesn't, depending on the state, the article status of the animal. Uh, so for the moment, we don't have um, uh, markers of dominance, so we are still looking for, for it. Uh, to get this a bit uh, more uh, precisely, but uh, I guess that even in females you have this dominance uh, hierarchy, so there should be some, we still need to be precise enough to find them. And um, yeah, so I couldn't link this urination behavior and so on to this uh, dominance uh, behavior. Well, I'm sorry, we have to a little bit speed up, so we'll have to move some questions to the Session, but last question from the Zoom, uh, Elodie, please. Uh, the question is, how do you distinguish between individual vocalization in, if there are in pairs or video at all? No, I cannot know who is vocalizing for the moment. So I, and I, yeah. Perfect, perfect short answer. <laughs> okay.